Uh, okay, so for today, again, for today, for the recording, today's meetup will be uh, talking about yet another year. It's a side project that I've built. It's a tiny New Year's resolution app um, that basically lets you write your New Year resolution. I've seen nothing, nothing like surprising or uh, no, no like super novel features. It was like a, a very tiny, tiny side project that I've made. Okay. So what I'll be going through in this talk is actually like the, the start is definitely like going through what is this project that I've made, uh, that I've built so that we all have context about what I'm going to talk about today. Like even if I'm gonna go through some chat, some technical stuff, at least you have an idea about um what I'm talking about and where in the part of the app that I'm talking about. So definitely the start is just an intro. Then after that, I'll be talking about a tech stack, which probably will be helpful um uh, for people who want to build your own 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 project. And then there are lots and lots of tools out there. So which one to choose, then maybe what I'm going, going, going to go through today will be some sort of like reference for you to, to, to choose. Of course, you, have few, you are still free to choose whatever you want, but at least there, there, there's some sort of reference that you know have been used to build something that you have seen before. Okay. Then the last part is where the meat of the, the talk will be about. It will be some challenges that I found really interesting, some decisions that I had to make which for while building this, this app, okay? So the first one is definitely like, what is yet another year? Uh, so yeah, another year is just a simple web application. So web application means like it's an it's a, it's a app. Um, in, in a sense, it, you can, it's not just a plain website. You can log in, log out, you can, save data in your account and do things with it. So it's like a web, but it, it lives on the browser. So, so therefore it's like a web application. So, so this web application, yeah, another year is just a new year. Like I say, it's a new year's resolution app. So it lets you write new year's resolution. It lets you track your progress for the year. And then it, and then it also lets you track resolutions over year, over the years right i guess I'm, I'm not sure about you guys but sometimes i i write them at the end of the year and then or the start of the year and then i write it on a piece of paper or or some some notes uh, in my computer and then i just forget where it is like then this then then it's gone i can't really look back so 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 this app also lets you just write, um, write, write it in years, and then you can just track, uh, across the years what what have you been aspiring to do. And one more thing is, uh, to be able to have a link that lets you share your New Year's resolution with whoever you want to share it with, or uh, and and then that that link will come in handy if you have your blog or something. You can just put it there. And and people who come to your blog or your website can link it out to 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 see your resolutions. So I I've launched this app in the middle of this year, like about end end July on on this website called Product Hunt. Uh, yeah. So it's I'll say like I launched it pretty recently. Okay, maybe six months not so recent. Yeah. So so okay before I go to there. I just want to show you guys what it looks like. So it looks like this. So this is like the the landing page or yeah, the landing page or some called the brochure. So it's like, okay, what the app is about. And then you can go to the web app and then, okay. And then you, you are prompted with a login screen. You can log in and here I use Google authentication and basically this is like almost everything. So you have like some progress bar. So if you don't know, now it's 18 November and we have 43 days left to the year. If you 
which is actually not a lot of time. Lah. So if you have a lot of things you have not done finishing this year, um, yeah, just keep in mind that you have about 40 days left. So, so then you can go forward by years and, and see what you have done behind uh, in the past years. And then the last part is that you can, oh, of course you can, you can like write, write new, new resolution here. Then you can like delete it. So it's like a to-do list, but then with the context of New Year's resolution. And you can share the link. So if you see a link like that, you, you get linked to a page that you cannot edit anything. So it's a, a good way to sh just share it, your New Year's resolution. Uh, yeah, that's about it for, for the app. So it's a pretty simple one. So, so the next one is like, what is the motivation that I built this thing? So I have been a software engineer for about five years. So I've, I've learned many, many things at work or just on meetups or on my own side projects, like other side projects that I, I've, I've tried to build. And then I just wanted to like put it all together to actually get something to launch, something. Uh, so a lot of projects like kind of stop halfway, um, lose steam or just the idea wasn't like really good enough to want to continue. So, so I decided that I want to build something really small to increase the chances of it actually like reach, reach a point where it can launch. And whether or not I continue development, then it doesn't really matter as long as that it's launched, it's uh, sort of like feature complete to for V1. Yeah, so so this is like why I started building this app to yeah, so to consolidate my learnings and to actually launch something. So the tech stack that I used to build yet another year is actually very, very simple. Uh, this stack has been around for a really long time. I mean, people, a lot of people have built with this stack. After that, they have moved off. and But a lot of people are still continuing to use this stack to build. So it's super simple. I highly recommend it for anybody who is like starting out, uh, building something and want to be fast in to, to push it out and get feedback from, from people. So this, for my stack, um, I use Heroku to host the app and the and the database. So and then so then I have Ruby on Rails, which is the server of my app, and then Postgres is the data storage layer. And then I have Webpack to compile all the assets, especially because here I also have a single page app which is built in Elm. Uh, it's a front end frame. Oh, uh, it's a language. It's a front end like language to build front end stuff. So, so Webpack here helps me compile my, my single page app, helps me manage my images, style sheets, et cetera, et cetera. And then for authentication, I use, I, I just use uh, Google authentication uh, for, for my app. And then, and then the way the, the back end and front end communicate is just a simple RESTful API. So this is the, the stack that I used to build yet another year. So next, I'll be going through some of the in interesting challenges. Um, here, again, I my focus is on the interesting, uh, not, not so much like, oh, very, very difficult problems, but more like, um, more like decisions that many people, I, at least I find that um, many people just take it for granted. Oh, it has to be like this. It has to be like that. But actually, I found I, when I was building it, I was trying to find simpler ways to do do some things, and then, and then, um, and then I found that these decisions that I made were pretty interesting, and it's it's something that anybody who starts out will probably face also. Okay. So the first first interesting challenge that I found is actually authentication. So because my app isn't like a, just a Ruby on Rails app, usually if you have just Ruby on Rails, you would just use like 
uh, session authentication, the Rails default session authentication. Um, and then for people have single page apps, people start to talk about uh, JSON web tokens and having like refresh token, uh, access tokens, etc. etc. And and then and then here I was thinking, oh okay, I need to do authentication. So how do I make sure that uh, the front end knows or the front end and back end knows who this user is? It must be able to persist, must be able to be secure, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Then I thought, okay, must I use JSON web tokens, which is like JWT, because um JWT has um they, they use some it has this like thing that can prevent people from changing the payload and all, and it's sort of like guarantee that to a good extent it guarantees that uh, this user is who he is. Then then I realized actually the default Rails cookie store works perfectly fine. It's because like cookie store, like the Rails cookie store is encrypted. The values in there is encrypted, it's considered generally safe. Uh, um, of course, it's still open to um, people from hijacking your cookies, but then there's like a separate topic altogether. Um, and then the and then on every API request from the front end to the back end, from the single page app to your server, it will always send the HTTP cookie. Uh, it was always send the cookie in the HTTP header anyway. So my server side will still be able to know who this user is just from the cookie. And the last part is like, it's close to zero setup because the Rails cookies uh, store comes like baked into Ruby on Rails. Of, of course, you still can do JWT. There are a lot of uh, like device, they have like a JWT version. I, I think that there are many, many frameworks that is like a drop-in replacement into Rails for the authentication system. So a lot of them also have JWT. So, so yeah, so of course those, if you just drop it in, it, it's probably um, also about the same amount of work, except your, your front end code needs to handle the JWT stuff. But here I just opted to use the default cookie store and it's really like, until now it's like perfect. Uh, and it's really zero setup time. So, so I in the end, I decided, okay, I'm just going to use this for the authentication. So this is like the first challenge that I, first decision that I, I found interesting that I had to make. So the next one is actually implementing uh, authentication, uh, OAuth. It's not, not, uh, yeah, this all, all I, I think like authentication, like it also falls under the bucket of authentication, but here is like a, a login uh, system using a third party or, or our provider. So in this case, in for yet another year, I use Google authentication, right? Google OAuth. So in the usual OAuth setting, you, the user will, you do a, you have a form on your, on your website user clicks, you do a post request to the server. The server will return a redirect to the, the, the unique URL of the authentication provider. And so you get redirected to Google and then Google, after you log in there, Google redirects the user back to, to your app. So, so I was thinking like, okay, I have a single page app. Single page app doesn't really deal with uh, redirects so much. At least, not that I can imagine how how they do it. Then, then I was thinking more and more, and I real then I thought about it, and, and I thought, oh, maybe, I mean, a single page app still renders HTML, right? So if I drop in a form, in there, it should still work, right? So I don't need to make an API call to the server and get the link back, and then use the single page app to redirect the user somewhere else. Instead, I just do a do the usual form submission from my single page app to the server, and then the server will return a, a 302, which is a redirect status code. And, and then everything is that 
works the same. So, okay, I'm going to try that. So, so that's like, uh, uh, the, the form submission all works. So that's like super cool. But after that, I realized that there's another problem is that in to do a form submission in Rails, you, there's this uh, security feature called CSRF. So it's like cross-site request for Jerry. Um, in, in short, it's CSRF. So there's a requirement is that in the form, in the, it needs to have a hidden field uh, a authenticity token hidden field that has a value that match the CSRF token so that the so that the server knows that this request is um, valid and then and then the 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 first problem I, I had was okay when I generate the this when the single page app generates the markup it doesn't know the CSRF token so so then how can it generate a form with the correct authenticity token and, and be able to do the post request successfully? So I went to research online. Um, many people have told me, okay, you just use JavaScript. Uh, I've read many people wrote, like you just use JavaScript when take the CSRF token from the page header and then you just inject it into the form. So, yeah, that, that, that generally works. But the problem that I realized as a SPA, a single page app is that by the time you get the token, it might not be valid anymore because the security feature keeps refreshing the token to make sure that um, make sure that every single point that you are making a request is, is legit, is from you. So, so here, I have a problem that the token might be outdated. So then, so that this 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 way doesn't really work. So the next another way that I found was that people say that you can when you load the spa, you can inject or you can just like pass this token to the to the single page app on on boot. So like for example, React you you usually have a have a have a HTML tag and then React just attach on, onto it and then generate the entire React app out. So, or, or any other single page app also works about the same. So, so it also has the same problem. The CSRF token is only at the start. And then, and then, um, and then when the app goes through a few requests, the, the token might not be, might not be valid anymore. So, so there's really no guarantee by the time the user does the post request, it will still be valid. So the last one that I found, which I was pretty surprised that I, I found that it worked, is that if you have your markup and you have this input tag hidden name authenticity token thingy, uh, this tag inside your form, if you do a full page reload, Rails UJS will automatically inject the value to this to this element so so all i needed to do is to make sure that the page that has the form does a full page reload so for me it was like the the like the obvious solution because i only need to have a full page reload for the the authentication page because that's the only page that has that that form um, for me to do this OAuth flow. So so I just in my in my front end, uh, my single page app, I just add add this um this HTML element, and then I just ensure that every time the user gets clicks a link that goes or gets redirected into this page, it's always a full full page reload, and then the form submission will work. So it's that okay? That's great. Awesome, everything works and it's like super simple. So, and it's like low overhead because there's only one page that requires this, this thing. So, yeah, so that is how I implemented OAuth in, in yet another year. So, the next one is uh, assets management. And in this case, assets, I'm talking about like images or icons. 
or like fonts, etc. Um, so here, if you are familiar with Rails, Rails has this Rails asset pipeline. Um, ever since the introduction of introduction of Webpacker, um, a few years ago, some people moved their like managing assets into Webpack. Some people leave it with still with Rails assets pipeline, but only have the JavaScript part, the single page app part that is packed by Webpack. Um, so for me, when I started out, I I I use the Rails asset pipeline to manage like the images. Um, after so in development environment, when I build the app, everything is fine. When I render the app, the images all renders properly, and then. When I pushed to production, then I realized that, oh, all the, all the assets broke. Uh, the images couldn't render, it couldn't be found, etc. So, so which then I realized that, okay, in, for the assets pipeline in, in development environment, it does not require the digest uh, at, the, at the back of the, the name of the asset. And then, but in production, it requires because for caching for caching purposes. So so then okay, now I know the problem. Then I tried to like find the correct file path for the image, which then made me realize that there's no easy way to get it for Rails asset pipeline. Uh, for traditional Rails app, they all use the URI helper to to help them generate the file path. But because I'm I'm building a single page app and I'm not using Ruby to build it. So I don't have, my single page app does not have access to the URI helper. So it makes it a bit difficult to, to get, to get the URL automatically generated in my single page app. So, and then when I try to get the URL, uh, with the digest is a bit hard also because only production has the digest. So I need to sort of like run it in production or something. So after that, then I decided, okay, it's too painful. I decided to, okay, move everything to Webpack, which is a bit contentious for many people. So I know people have a lot of issues with Webpack, but I actually have close to zero issues with Webpack. Everything works perfectly. The development production environment with Webpack all requires the digest. So dev and pro environment is exactly the same. No surprises. If it works in dev, it works in production. And then uh, Webpack always give me the full URL with the digest, which I can just code it into the code it into my single page app. So everything works perfectly. So then I decided to use Webpack to manage my assets. So and the last one that I've found interesting that I do think I think I I it made me think a bit more about me. <laughs> okay, so identity um was interesting because these days in the past we always see like username and password login. That's it. There's only every website uses the same way of logging in. But these days, or actually for quite a few years now, we, we've seen uh, all of providers. We've seen Google authentication. We've seen Facebook. Like Facebook also can do all of, GitHub also can do all of, like many, many, many different services allows you to do all of with them. And then there are newer ones like passwordless login. These days, a lot of phone, num phone number logins, etc. So I was thinking like, how can I make sure that my authentication system scales for any future type of authentication method in the future? So then here, instead of only have a user table, I have a identities table also. So each identity correspond to a unique authentication method. So, so maybe if I have five authentication methods, because uh, this is like a table, right? So even if next time I can scale to 100 authentication methods, it, it should all scale properly. So I should be able to handle as many authentication methods as I want, want to. 
So, so all these identities from different authentication methods will be able to map to a single user. So in the in the future, if a user is worried that he forget, like if the user comes to the website, he has like five. The website has five different ways of logging in, and the user is worried that they forget which one did they use in the first time. They can link all all the authentication met, uh way authentication ways to a single user, and then it always maps back to the same same user. So, so this this model sort of allow allow for this, and the last one is like each authentication method. Now that I have a unique identities record, each different authentication method. Maybe in the future you require some special keys or something, right? So I will be able to save all this information for for different authentication method. So. What I found that I think that this, this models is pretty scalable. And as far as I can think of, I think that it should scale well if in the future I want to introduce other types of uh, login methods. Yeah. So actually, that's all that I have today. Uh, yeah. So open to any questions uh, about the talk. I think I can start off, right? I don't understand like, why, why you chose Elm over like other like frameworks. Ah, uh, uh, because I just thought that I wanted to try something new. <laughs> so, so of course, like in the, in the midst of this thing, I also wanted to learn something new um, so then I did I decided to try Elm uh, it's not just learning a new framework it, because it's like functional programming so I also was a bit curious over the years about like what functional programming is so so I decided to give it a shot yep any other questions do you like implement the O of like without any gem? Like, do you Sorry, use come again. Do you use any like gem for like the O of? No, actually I wrote my own. I've been I've read online, I've been warned that it's uh is is a bit dangerous if you implement your own. Um but I I tried to use the Omi of Gem and then they 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 had some issues with this basic flow. I actually I'm surprised that it doesn't like work so well. Um so in the end I I wrote my own. So I, I tried I so I, I dug through the docs and the Google's docs and then I implemented whatever everything that they recommended. So in the end I, I wrote my own O of flow. I, I wouldn't say it's very it's actually not very difficult if you um if you understand what is happening. Uh so I would say like still do it with caution. Uh but it's, it's worth a shot. Mm. Okay, any other questions? If not, sorry, I sorry, think... I a bit oh. lagging. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, okay. Can I ask no about you said you launched it on Product Hunt, right? Um, yeah. Is it possible to kind of share like, uh, if you, what was your experience like in terms of like launching a product? Um, do you get any traction, uh, feedback from users, anything like that? Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh. The the experience pretty interesting, but I would say that I didn't get any traction. <laughs> so so I felt like okay, I've no experience at all launching a product. Then I don't know like okay, what should go first, what should go next, etc. How to deal with like marketing and and all. So so it was like a really, 
very interesting experience and it's like a, a learning experience for me. So so what I did actually is quite straightforward lah. Uh, you go to product hunt, you you upload whatever you up, have to upload, you fill up this form, you set a launch date and After I under like after I've gone through it, okay, things start to make a bit more sense. What I can imagine other people are doing before the launch date, like you submit all everything up already, right? Then before before the launch date, people will be like advertising, telling their friends, telling everybody, uh, and just like um uh, getting traction, getting people to look at it, and then at the during the launch date, um, actually I. I don't know what what can people still do then. Maybe just replies all the questions, reply all the questions and all. Uh, so uh, so mine was like quite bad. I I I say I I I think because like the the day I launched, okay then, I didn't do any of the before pre launch thing. So the day I launched, I just like share with some of my friends, and then immediately like the, I was it was pointed out that the the login wasn't working <laughs> so so the launch day is today like yesterday i was like okay i need to fix this thing then then i realized that i, I broke something then i said i didn't know i broke something then then tomorrow it launched and then it wasn't working so so the launch day was pretty like scary because i didn't have any experience so so then i had the the day i had to after i launched then people tell me that it wasn't working then I had to go and faster go and fix it. Uh, yeah. So I didn't get much traction to be honest. Like just friends trying it or that's it. And and it wasn't but it was a very good experience. Lah. So whether or not your app uh takes off or not, I feel that it's always good to just try once. Uh, then in the future you you just like get better and launching product. You might know how to do the marketing better. You you might know how to do the after that better, etc. So definitely do something small and give it a shot. Lah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, how, do you, how do you do all the CI or oh, that test all this? Like do you use OSPET? Oh, uh, I wrote my test in, I use mini test, but I would imagine like mini test R spec is about the same. Uh, for me, I, I've, I've like tests all written, but I actually didn't do CICD because it's like super tiny. I just, from my console, I just push it out to Heroku and just deploy. Uh, for, for me, it's a really small app, so I don't really see, and I'm the only person working on it. So I didn't really see a point in setting up all the CI/CD workflows. Uh, to me, it doesn't really matter. Um, and of course, I still write my tests and making sure my app, I can continuously uh, work on my app with confidence with the tests in place. But I didn't use the, I didn't have a CI/CD pipeline. Okay, uh, I think that we are, actually we are over time already. So, <laughs> so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop the, I'll stop the, the talk here. And then, um, yeah, and then I can close up the meetup. Okay. So, let me stop the sharing. <laughs>